This time on Jonathan Bird's Blue World, Jonathan visits a submerged Mayan burial ground. Hi, I'm Jonathan Bird, and welcome to my world. Sixty-six million years ago, an enormous asteroid tumbled through space. Traveling ten times the speed of a rifle bullet, this celestial missile was on a direct collision course with Earth. It smashed into Earth with such force that it triggered powerful earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. The impact threw a cloud of dust into the atmosphere, cooling the planet and killing the dinosaurs. The impact crater is located just north of the Yucatan Peninsula in what is now Mexico. Around the outer ring of the crater, cracks formed in the limestone, allowing groundwater to flow through, eroding into caves. When a cave ceiling gets too thin and falls in, you get what is known as a cenote. The word cenote was derived from the Mayan word cenote, meaning sacred well a source of water, and an entrance to the caves. Fast forward to 2,000 years ago, the Maya civilization dominated Central America. They built their cities near the cenotes so they had access to fresh water from what are essentially super clean underground rivers. Thanks to that asteroid, there are more cenotes in this area than any place else in the world, thousands of them running along the rim of the ancient crater. It's an incredible place for some underwater exploration. To begin our adventure, cameraman Todd and I fly down to Merida, Mexico, a city surrounded by thousands of mostly unexplored cenotes. Our first stop, Freedom Divers, where I meet owner Jeff Shaw, my host for underwater exploration. Jeff? Jonathan. Hey, hey. Nice to meet you, man. Nice to meet you. Welcome to Merida. Thanks. Ready to do some diving? Let's go hit some cenotes. All right, let's go. All right. We pile all our gear into Jeff's pickup truck and drive south. We stop along the way to pick up his friend Aaron Diaz, a local cave diving expert, and a few of his local guides, Elmer, Felipe, and Carlos. We drive out into the bush and the road slowly turns into barely more than a path. Eventually, the guides get out and use machetes to clear the brush for the truck. At last, we reach Cenote Sha'an, and the guides start setting up. Looking inside the Cenote, I can tell you this. I would not want to fall in there by accident. The surface of the water is 50 feet down, and the only way out would be climbing a tree root. But it's absolutely breathtaking. This is gonna be an adventure. Elmer, Felipe, and Carlos are rigging some ropes so that we can rappel down to the water. Meanwhile, the dive team is getting ready. This is a full cave dive with all the gear that requires, plus something extra. This is one of the unique pieces of gear we're using today, something you don't normally see scuba diving, a climbing harness. Ready to go. With the ropes all set up, it's time for our team to rappel down into the cenote. Jeff goes first to demonstrate. <laughs> Next, it's my turn. While I've never started a dive with a rappel, I did learn to rappel in high school, so I can't resist the urge to show off a little. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> 
The trees that we're rappelling down are actually roots. They don't go down into the bottom. Once they reach the water, they stop with a gap underneath that makes them look like anti-gravity trees. It takes a while to get everyone and their gear down into the water. The divers can rappel, but all the tanks and cameras have to be lowered carefully to us. At last, with all of our gear, we can follow the beams of sunlight down into the cenote. In the middle of the cenote is a debris pile, principally made of the rock that fell when the ceiling collapsed, opening this cave to sunlight. But toward the edges of the cenote, it gets deeper. Aron leads the way to a permanent guideline into the cave. Soon we have passed into the cave, out of sight of sunlight. We swim into a massive chamber, larger than a basketball court. The water is crystal clear. At the back of the chamber, a passageway leads into the wall. As I approach, Aron suggests I go first to get some great shots without anyone kicking up the silt. I slowly head inside, not sure what to expect. This is what I love about cave diving. So much adventure exploring the unknown. And there's something cool about swimming through a crack in the rock. I lead the way into a gorgeous passageway that almost looks like a miniature riverbed with pebbles paving the floor. The white limestone walls reflect my video lights making beautiful illumination. In a few minutes, we reach an intersection, and I'm not sure which way to go, so I stop and wait for Jeff and Aaron. Jeff gives us the turn around sign. This is as far as we go today. Heading back out, I hang back a ways to get some shots of Jeff and Todd ahead of me. Working our way back towards the cavern, Aaron removes a section of line he laid on the way in. Then we make our way back up into the sunlit waters of the cavern. Jeff has found a cow bone in the debris pile. It's not hard to imagine an animal wandering through the woods and accidentally falling into this deep pit. Near the bone, the skull. Complete with a few remaining teeth. Finally, we surface, and now the hard work is about to begin. To get us back out of the cenote, the guides lower a rope ladder. That ladder's not long enough. We're not sure if this is gonna work, but hopefully it will because we're not very good at climbing trees. It looks like it would be easy to climb, but I assure you, it's not. First, Jeff heads up while Aaron tries to keep it tension so it won't flip around sideways. Next, it's my turn. Here we go. <laughs> By halfway up, my arms are burning from the effort. <sighs> then it's cameraman Todd's turn.
50 feet from the surface of the water to the top of the cenote seemed like an eternity when I was climbing up and my arms were burning, but it was so worth it. That was the most amazing dive. Not all cenotes are small holes with water way down inside. We take a walk through the woods to a cenote so large that it looks more like a lake. And in a small town outside Merida, we check out the town well, which is just a cenote with a tiny opening. I would love to dive in there, but they probably don't want a scuba diver in their water supply. Even today, the cenotes allow access to clean, fresh water. But to the Mayans, cenotes were not just sources of water. Cenotes were also believed to be entrances to the underworld and therefore pathways to the gods. In pre-Columbian times, the Maya people ruled Central America. They built staggering cities, which included massive step pyramids as temples to the Maya gods. They performed rituals that they believed would keep the gods happy to ensure their good fortune. The Mayans would often throw offerings into the cenotes to please Cha'ak, the rain god. Sometimes those offerings included human sacrifices. Would it be possible to dive in a cenote used by the Mayans for human sacrifices? That's where we're going. Don't go away. Jonathan's about to explore a spooky underwater burial ground. Our team is piling into the truck and driving back out into the bush to visit a very special cenote used by the Mayans for human sacrifices. We arrive at Cenote San Antonio. The opening was enlarged and reinforced at some point to be rectangular. But this tiny opening was once an important place to the Mayans. So important that we had to get a special permit to dive here. Once again, our guide set up some pulleys and rope to get us and our gear in and out of the cenote. Might be hard to believe, but this dive is even more difficult than the last one. There is no room for error. We will only get one shot at this. Our team suits up with only a vague idea of what we're going to see on the other side of that tiny hole in the ground. We start with a meeting to discuss our plan. Because of the way this cenote was formed, it's safer to be lowered into it rather than repel. Aaron goes first. Once he gets down there, I can see just how far down that is. <laughs> I really don't want to climb a rope ladder out of this. All right. As they lower me into the opening and through to the other side, I'm swinging in free space as I descend, spinning with the rope. I'm rock climbing. <laughs> free flowing. From down on the water, Aaron turns on a light so I can see. The room in here is massive. The ceiling is like a dome. You could never climb out. This cenote is a deadly trap for anything that falls or is thrown inside. Once I'm in the water, I can see bats and stalactites. Soon the guides lower the rest of the team, tanks and cameras one at a time. It's a very slow process. Oh, here comes my baby. <laughs> By the time we start our dive, I've been floating in the water for more than half an hour. I'm curious though, exactly how they're gonna get me out of here. But for the time being, I'm ready with a camera, lots of lights, and my natural curiosity. Aaron and Jeff lead us below. 
The sides of the cenote are covered in ancient dripstone formations formed probably during the last ice age when sea levels were lower and this cenote was at least partially dry. The walls are made of sedimentary rock formed from an ancient seabed. All kinds of shells are stuck in it, including this perfectly formed sea urchin skeleton. As we drop further, I focus my camera on a jawbone. It's the jaw of a horse, which probably fell in here by accident and drowned. Nothing can escape this watery trap. Near the jaw, I find my first trace of a human presence, a broken piece of pottery. I have to get my head around the fact that this is a pre-Columbian artifact more than a thousand years old. Moving away from the walls and out into the middle of the cenote, I find a bone. This is no horse bone, it's a human tibia, the lower leg bone. And near it, the femur. Humans are buried here. Not far away, a ghostly sight. A human skull resting peacefully next to a perfectly intact earthen bowl. At this depth, in fact, there are human remains almost everywhere I turn. directs me to a field of human remains laying out on the sand in plain view. This skull has its jaw sitting nearby. Of course, we don't touch or disturb anything. Not only is this a grave site, but it's part of an ongoing archaeological study. We can look, but we definitely cannot touch. Dozens of bodies at the bottom of this cenote, and I have to wonder what was happening here. Were these people sacrificed to the gods, or were they simply people who died and were buried here? about this place is the preservation of the bones which are at least a thousand years old. If only these bones could talk, what would they tell us about life in the pre-Columbian Maya culture? and Aaron direct me to a shelf on the wall at 90 feet. There, resting peacefully, the remains of two people. Did they know each other? Is their proximity a coincidence? How did they get on this shelf? All questions that will likely never be answered. Nearby, a jaw with molars that have cavities. What can be learned of the ancient Mayans from clues like this? But not everything down here is about death. This cenote has some of the most prolific cave fauna I've ever seen, including many blind cave fish, and a species of cave isopod I've never seen before. With the dive coming to an end, we slowly ascend and finally surface into the pitch darkness of the cenote. 
That was the spookiest dive of my life, and I'm definitely ready to get back to the sunlit world above. Elmer, Felipe, and Carlos have to lift each of us and all of our gear out with a block and tackle. It's hard work, and these guys are stronger than they look. Hi guys! <laughs> Thanks for hoisting me up! <laughs> Merida, Mexico is not particularly close to the ocean, but the vast network of unexplored cenotes nearby and the rich Mayan history of the area makes it one of the most fascinating dive destinations I've ever visited. Without question, I'll be back to explore more cenotes. Who knows what secrets they hold in their deep blue depths.